So anyway, um, it's, it's unique with a human woman, and that is because I believe God uh, ordained it to be that way back in Genesis chapter 3. And I'm saying all that for a reason because um, I mentioned this last week. If you want to understand the second coming of Christ, study his first coming. The clues are there. And all that it entails, those things, we may not understand them today, but give it enough time, learn some more scriptures, get a, get a greater knowledge of the whole of the Bible, and God will show you some things. So in John chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus said this, and he is in reference to, he's going to leave they will, they will be, they will miss him while he's gone, but he says, I have to leave because if I don't leave, then the comforter won't be sent to you, but I promise you, if I leave, I'm coming back. Uh, that's similar to the promise that God made to the uh, people of Judah and Benjamin was in, in the situation where, uh, Jeremiah had to buy his cousin's field. That was in Anathoth, and he paid 16 shekels of silver. They weighed out the silver, and they wrote it down in two copies of a book. One was sealed, one was open. And God wanted the Israelites to know, the people of Judah to know, even though I'm taking you out of this land, I'm not giving your land away. I'm going to let some people come in and live in it. They're going to maintain the fields, and they'll probably keep some of you Jews here to manage the fields and, and, and you know what kind of uh, religious services you need to have and so on. But God is telling Jeremiah, let them know that after 70 years, I'm going to bring them back into that land and their houses and their vineyards and their land will be owned once again. So uh, what I'm taking you away and why I'm taking you away, don't worry, I will bring you back. And how many of us have recognized times when you knew God was disappointed with us, God was mad at us, and God said, okay, I'm going to take this away from you. And you think, oh no, it's lost forever, oh no, I'll never get it back. But when God gives it back, He gives it back better than it was. It's more important to you now than it ever was. And you never want to lose it ever again. Once you got it, you're going to keep it, Amen. So he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the, word shall, uh, the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. I underline that. Because her hour is come. So does the travail precede the birth, or does it show up after the birth? Depends on what kind of little devil you have. <laughs> Man, I was in a lot less pain when I was giving birth to you than I am now. Uh, because her hour has come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. For joy that a man is born into the world, and you know, and ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you. If I were to just preach a message on that right there, I would basically say it like this. If man can save you, man can take your salvation away. But if man cannot save you, or a religious institution can't save you, then man can't take it away. There is a certain, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on this word tonight. Help us, Father, to be faithful to it. Give us good understanding, Lord, of things that we cannot see. But Father, the faith that we have in your Bible is the evidence of things not seen. And so, Lord, I don't, in myself, I don't know what the future holds, but I believe the Bible. And in that sense, Father, I have all the evidence I need of the things that I cannot see. I know how they'll happen. And this book is the substance of everything that I hope to have, but I don't have it yet. I have it now in the form of the promises that you made me. That's what faith is. Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us faith. Lord, increase our faith. 
As we try to live in this wicked world, uh, we ask your blessings now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Boy, I'm glad I prayed, but now I don't remember what I, was, what I got cut off over. Oh, let's see. What was I going to say? Huh? There's a, yeah. It'll probably come to me in a little bit. They say the mind's first thing to go. Um, I can't remember it. Anyway, um, let's take a look at, we were, we were looking at places in the Bible where um, a travailing woman is mentioned or a people in travail. Uh, we touched on this. Uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. We touched on this last week. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, only to uh, get us going in the direction that we're going to uh, tonight. Uh, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. And I think the words matter. Paul is, a, is speaking of the group to whom the destruction is going to come. He didn't say, then sudden destruction comes upon us. Because as we read this particular passage, it clearly shows us a difference in that day between what is going to happen to us versus what is going to happen to them in that day. So he says, when they shall say peace and safety. Uh, let me just do this. Let me throw this out to the room tonight. Who are the they that say? Who are the they that say peace and safety? Who is it? Yeah, just to, give me your best guess. There'll be no points taken off. Those in power. Okay, that's pretty good. Anybody else? They, when they shall say peace and safety. So you said, uh, you said what? Those in power, the Antichrist, the false prophet. Okay, I think both answers work. Um, because we know from uh, places like Ezekiel 13, Ezekiel 24, that the prophets of the last days are all the time saying to everybody, peace, peace, and God says, there is no peace. And he said, they didn't get that from me. I didn't tell them to tell everybody it's going to be peace, but they are going to tell everybody, oh, what you read in the Bible, that's not for us. Now, that's for somebody else, but that's not... For us, this is why I encourage you. And if you don't know anything about this, don't worry about it. Don't go studying it. But those who have been confronted with the doctrines of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism likes to take whole chunks of the Bible and almost like separate it into a different book and then tell you, you don't need to read that. Because that doesn't, that's not for us. That's for Israel, all of those things. And I'm talking about all of the Old Testament, the four Gospels, the book of Acts, and then uh, the epistles Peter wrote, the book of James, uh, all three letters that John wrote, um, Jude, and the book of Revelation, you are not to get any of your doctrine from them. They are always quick to say those were written for the Jews and they're not for us. So if you limit yourself then to only the 13 or 14 books that Paul wrote and they, they even dispute over the book of Hebrews and say, well, we don't think Paul wrote that so we're going to put that over in the do not read pile. And so you're down now to about 13 books starting with Romans Ending up in Hebrew. No, not even Hebrews. Titus Philemon. You end up with Philemon from Romans Philemon. Those are the only books that we're supposed to get our doctrine from. And that's crazy. And you know why that is? 
They say, well, the rest of the Bible contradicts our doctrine. Look, change your doctrine. Change your doctrine. Amen. And, they, and they'll tell you. This is what's funny, Melissa. They'll tell everybody. Now, we don't get our doctrine from Hebrews at all. That was written for the Jews. You miss one Sunday of service and they find out that you went to the park somewhere, they're going to pull out the book of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Well, that's in Hebrews. I didn't think that mattered to us. But I think that they are, include the false prophets of the last days. They're saying peace, peace, and there is no peace. They're saying that these things that God wrote, they're not, they don't apply to us. God is not going to do that to us. You have nothing to worry about. We're going to prosper. and We're going to succeed. And we're going to be empowered. We're going to take over the earth. And um, I also, this is my personal theory. I think that the evil angels of those last days are going to come and establish rule over this earth and declare a time of peace and safety. See, he's never identified it. He just says they. So a lot of people have tried to I, say, well, it's this. I think it's going to be Henry Kissinger. I mean, he tried for peace. It's going to be whatever. It was supposed to be Ronald Reagan. It was supposed to be this. And anybody you don't like, you just say is the Antichrist. But I think that the ascended masters, the spiritual overlords, the archons, all these names that the new age people have for basically evil angels, the word from these evil angels is don't worry about a thing. Everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be peace. We're going to keep you in safety. And God says, when you hear him say that, boom, get ready. Sudden destruction shall come upon them as Travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Now, I believe that there is a reason. Now, it says we brethren are not in darkness that, that they should overtake you as a thief. So I believe that there is a reason why God sends forth these evil angels to sort of establish themselves as like the rulers over earth and the people of the earth are going to welcome them. They're going to want them to be here. They're going to want them establishing a new religious code that covers everybody on the earth. So there's only one religion. Everybody will have a, a uh, live under one government. And they'll say, we don't want any more wars. And so if we all were part of the same government, yeah, that was the message. Roy, if you remember these days, back when they were sending all the Mercury astronauts and all the Gemini astronauts up and the Apollo astronauts they were looking down on the earth and they said, you know what we see? We don't see any borders. We don't see any lines like we see on the maps in our schools. We don't see any places where the earth is divided. So maybe that's a message to us that we should all be part of the same thing. Um, the Apollo 14 astronaut, uh, his name is right on the tip of my tongue. Um, he was a very, very knowledgeable scientist. He was one of the first actual scientists that got to go to the moon. He always signed his letters as he was the sixth man to walk on the moon. Edgar Mitchell. When Edgar Mitchell was coming back from the moon, he had spent a couple days on the lunar surface, did all these experiments. He, you know, he's the one you see dump, jumping and dancing around on the moon and riding the moon buggy and all that stuff. And he just has himself a ball as he's coming back to earth. There's not a whole lot to do. It's just a three-day ride back to earth. And he said that he's looking out at all the stars because he can see way more stars in that capsule than he ever could on earth because there's no atmosphere to block him out. And he's looking out there and he said, all of a sudden, an energy came over him, a power came over him. And he said, I went into sort of a, a trance-like state and he said, the wisdom that was given to me at that time showed me that my atoms that make up my body were around before I was ever born in this world. 
that I came from my parents, their, my, their parents came from their parents, at some point, some kind of life came to planet Earth, life on planet Earth, which means that the life that we have now used to be out among the stars. And what he could see was, was that every star, every planet, every moon, every sun, every meteor, every living creature, every molecule and every atom was all connected together. Yes, it was. And that was called, um, he had what is called in the, in the uh, Hindu religion, a samadhi experience. He went into a trance and then was convinced that his body was one with everything, including God. So how is it that this brilliant scientist, one of the best of the best men that we have in our country at that time, a scientist and an Apollo astronaut, Edgar Mitchell, how is it that he has this massive, life-changing religious experience? I think there's something about leaving this earth and going out there that changes people. And so, all of a sudden now, he sees that we're all united together, and that means we're united already with God. So you really cannot die. You just go back to God from whence you came from, and that's it. Or maybe God sends you back in a different form. Crazy stuff that these guys came back and went through, all right? A lot of the astronauts that went out in the, in the Apollo, Gemini, Mercury missions, they came back. Many of them had serious problems. All of them became alcoholics. Every one of them became alcoholics. Most of them divorced right as soon as they got through with the Apollo program. They divorced. They couldn't. Their wife got tired of it. They got, and, and so their lives began to just fall apart. Now, here's what I'm saying all this to say this. Go to Matthew 13. Malachi, in about two minutes, I'm going to have you come up here and preach the rest of this for me. Or is that Alicia making that noise? Matthew 13. Um, in verse... Um, Verse uh, 24. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came, sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. Uh, so ask the question now, considering what I've just shared with you. Do you really want to be equal and one with the tares that have been sowed into this field. No, you want no part of it. Because you know that where you are going to end up is not the same place that they're going to end up. And there's an order to this. I'm, I'm sort of letting you in on what I saw today. But I never saw it that way before, but I see it now. And so... Um, the enemy came in, sowed in tares. Verse 26, But when the uh, blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And you've seen me talk about this before. I put it up on the screen to illustrate it. Uh, if I show you a picture of wheat, I show you a picture of tares in their early stage. They look, you really can't, unless you know exactly what you're looking for, you really can't tell the difference between wheat and tares. And tares are poisonous and wheat is not. Wheat is food. And so, uh, verse 27 or verse 28, uh, the landowner saith unto them, uh, uh, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, nay. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so from this, um, we get the same idea. Uh, and I just had it in my mind again and it's gone. 
Um, we're going to go to, uh, we've already looked at that. We're going to go to first, no, we're not going to go, to, we're going to Genesis 25 here in a minute. Um, but anyway, obviously, oh, I know where I'm going, 2 Thessalonians 2. Obviously, the husbandman, the man who owned the field, whose seed it was that he told his servants to go out and sow, knew that there was great risk if the servants went out and tried to pull up the tares while both species were still green, that there was a high probability that they would accidentally pull up wheat as well and burn it in the fire. And the husbandman, the, the landowner, the farmer says, we're not going to do it that way. Lest you bring up the wheat and we need the wheat. So what we're going to do is I've run into this before and I know what's going to happen at harvest. It's going to be a lot easier for you to do this at harvest. You're going to see the wheat turn golden brown, just like the sun. And that's what the, the parable teaches. The righteous shall shine forth as the sun. The tares are going to turn black. And who would be able to go out and tell the difference between black grass and yellow grass? Okay? So then, then it's going to be easier. So the first thing you do is you go out and pull up the tares first. Bind them in bundles. And get them out of the way. Then, we're going to gather the wheat. Okay? God gives us the order that this is going to be done in. So, 2 Thessalonians 2, the same order. The same, God's going to do it the same way as this. He says in verse 3 of chapter 2, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. All of the evil people are going to fall. And you've heard me tell and express my opinion in that um, I think that these evil people, or I think this falling away is literally going to happen. I think a spirit is going to overcome most of the people who are living on the earth at that time and they literally will not be able to stand. Literally. In the day that the music was supposed to sound, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, image was set up there and he said at the sound of the, of the music, I want everybody to fall down and worship that image. When that music sounded and everybody fell to the ground, Except three men. It's easy to spot then who's on God's side and who's not. The, but it's the people that fall first. And then after that, the salvation of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, he says that. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And I can't remember the exact specific day, but I remember the in general the day that I was reading this and I just I just looked at it and I said, I don't think the rapture comes first. I don't believe that anymore. I think this spells it out plainly. That God is going to gather the wicked. They're going to, they're going to get, they're going to gang up on their side. And everybody that's left is going to be the righteous. Okay. Now, uh, where did I tell you to turn? Oh, yeah. It's there. Turn on the screen. Genesis 25. Turn there. Well, now, last Wednesday night, we talked about this travailing woman and how um, it is a birthing that takes place that establishes, number one, those who are on Christ's 
side and on his kingdom and a birthing that takes place so that those who are on the devil's side will be on the devil's side and they will be worshiping their Christ uh, and abiding by their gospel and filled with their spirit which has nothing to do with the true spirit of God, the true gospel of God, and the true savior of all mankind, Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with it. And everybody's going to be divided on that day. And it's, it's going to be easy for you to tell who is and who isn't. And I get that illustration of, uh, number one, uh, the two evil priests of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, who had committed all these sins, they were stealing offerings, they were laying with all the women that came to the temple, um, that Phineas' wife was travailing and ready to give birth when Eli the priest heard that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken. He had heard that his two sons had been killed, but that's not what did it, that's not what did him in. It was him finding out that the Ark was taken that's what did him in. And he must have had some kind of stroke or something like that. And he literally fell backward. And the Bible says he was a, a, a big man. And when he fell backward, he fell completely off his stool and broke his neck and killed him. So there's your falling first that takes place. After that is when uh, Phineas's wife travails, gives birth. And she dies, and everybody says, well, his name's going to be Ichabod. Because the Ark of the Covenant had been taken, we're going to call him Ichabod, the glorious departed. Okay? But then, you have the other birth. You have Revelation 12, where you have the woman in heaven. Which, uh, I, I'm, to those of you online waiting for the next watchman, keep waiting. Because I'm getting into some heavy stuff. And it's all going to be about Mary. And believe you me, the worshiping of Mary is none other than you're bowing before Mystery Babylon herself in disguise. I'm telling you. You're going to hear me tell a story 500 years ago of a, a Mexican native, and he was an Aztec, he was of the Aztec tribe, named Juan Diego who had an apparition of Mary up on top of this hill. She had him go pick flowers that were out of season, but magically they were bloomed. He picks them and he has this, like a, some kind of clothing around his neck, sort of like, uh, you know, women would wear an apron and it was like a utility clothing. That's where you carried, you know, all your stuff in and that's how you shelled peas in and stuff like that. Well, he had one of those as a, as a poor farmer. And he gathered all the roses inside of his, uh, there's a word for it, I can't remember what it was. And, and Mary told him to take those to the bishop there in Mexico City and tell the bishop, these flowers are a sign, because they're out of season, they're a sign that I'm telling you, I've seen the Virgin Mary, and she demands that we build her a shrine. Now right there I have a problem. When Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah was with him. I mean, the glory was there, wasn't it? And it was Peter who said, he was like shaking. He's like, oh, oh, oh well, well, I got an idea. We're going to build a temple for Elijah and a temple for Moses and a temple for you. And, and Jesus said, Peter, you have no idea what you're talking about. Just calm down. Okay? Uh, because Jesus knew that the only temple he was going to abide in was the one he built himself. And I always think that's interesting because there's at least, I know of at least three appearances of Mary, so-called, in the last five, six hundred years, where when Mary shows up, she's always demanding that everybody builds a shrine to her, and it's going to be a place where everybody can adore her and worship her and, and say the rosary to her. That's not God. God doesn't demand us to build big shrines for God. God will do a much better job. Amen? But anyway, when he went to present those roses 
to the, the archbishop there. He untied his little garment and they fell out. And he noticed that everybody that was looking at him got down on their knees, some even on their faces before him. And he's like, what's going on? And he looked down and there was an, an image of the Virgin Mary surrounded in glory, radiance coming off of her. She's standing on the moon because they believe Revelation 12, she's the woman that gives birth. And they don't, to this day, they don't know how that image got on there. They know for a fact that the guy, Juan Diego, was not an artist of any kind. And it's been, that, that garment is still just as fresh as it was 500 years ago. They've examined it. It has no brush strokes in it. It doesn't have special knit, uh, knitting in it or anything like that. There's no reason for that image to be on there. And yet there it is. Do I believe that it really happened? Yeah, I do. Because I believe that in the last days, people are going to see false signs and lying wonders. Okay? And what happened was that, that Mary, she said, I want to be known as Guadalupe. And it's called the Virgin of Guadalupe. And because of that incident, practically everybody that lives Mexico on south all the way down in Argentina primarily they're Roman Catholic and they see that Mary as sort of their savior and they'll live and die for her. Okay. Now, uh, in Genesis 25, God tells Rebecca, Rebecca, you're going to have a baby. In fact, you're going to have two of them. And he says in verse 23, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be what? What's the word? Separated, split apart. Good guys on one side, bad guys on another. We know that the one is called Jacob. What was the name of the other one? Everybody say Esau. I just want to know you're awake. Thank you. Esau. You can tell every state, man. He says, Esau. And what did God say later on about Esau? What did he say about Jacob? Jacob have I loved. And then what did he say about Esau? But I've hated Esau. Now, does that sound fair? Well, if you're God, it is fair because God already knows what Esau was going to do. What's the other name for Esau in the Bible? Edom. You know what word that is? You know where it came from? It's a form of the word Adam. And Adam was named that because it literally means red, like the dirt that he was made out of. Okay, and it doesn't matter what color you are on the outside when you peel the skin off. What color are you? Red. So Edom is cursed. And when Edom is born, they look at him and what's different about him? He's got hair all over him. He's a beast. He's a representation of, number one, he's a representation of fallen man. He's a representation of man serving the beast, joining with the beast, uniting with the beast. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And God says, them I hate. But Jacob have I loved. Now, who was born first? Esau. Now, I didn't see you jump up and go, Woo! Oh, praise the Lord! Amen! God, oh, that's so good! I didn't quite have that reaction either, but I get it. This birthing that takes place with all these travailing women, all through the Bible, I believe that the two are going to be born 
about the same time. But clearly, and now think of it, if, if you don't, think of it like this. Out of the two births that you had, which one is the better? The first one or the second one? We went through that a couple Sundays ago. The second birth is better. So does Esau have to be born first to follow God's plan? Yeah, he does. It's the thing that God hated. The red man, the flesh man. You get it? Jacob he loves. Jacob was born second. Okay? Uh, give her another medic. Whatever you heard of. Make her smart. Um, Jacob is a type of those who are born again. And God says, I love them. They came second. But Adam, Edom, the man of red dirt, he was born first and God says, him I hate, but him I love. And so naturally, Esau is going to be born first because that follows then God's plan all through the Bible. The evil is going to come first. That man of sin, there shall be a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed. How is it going to be revealed? In a birthing. We can't tell who he is. We don't know what he is. We don't know what he's going to look like. We don't know, we don't know when he's going to appear. There's all these things that we don't know. And if you get on the internet and you find some idiot that has put out videos that are clickbait trying to get you to believe that they have, they know who the Antichrist is going to be and they've got it all figured out. Don't waste your time and don't click on their videos because they'll get money for that. And I want these guys to starve a very slow death. Just, I'm being mean here. But anyway, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Because once you are saved, who now is in charge? It's not supposed to be the flesh anymore. Okay? My spirit and my soul said, we're having church tonight. My flesh said, I wonder how we can get out of this. Sound familiar, Bethel people? I ain't talking to you guys here. I'm talking to ones of men. The old man, the guy that came first said, I wonder how we can get out of this. I'm being mean, but you see my point. Esau will always try to draw you away from Living your Christian life and your Christian potential. It's Jacob who always says, uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to live God's way. And that's how it's going to be done. So the elder, your old man, must serve the new man on the inside of you. Does that make sense to everybody? So I think that's also God's prophetic plan. The evil is going to be manifested fully in front of our eyes, which obviously means that there are going to be some things that when we look at them in the Bible, we say, boy, I hope I'm gone when that happens because that's going to be bad. And yet, rather think of it as, what a great opportunity for us to see the power of God in real action. Why did God drag Israel to the beach of the Red Sea and then went and got Pharaoh and locked them in there? He could have just let them go. He could have let them take the easy route. He could have let them get all the way to the other side and 20 miles down the road before he ever hardened Pharaoh's heart. But he didn't do it that way. He brought Pharaoh over there, those horses and those chariots, ready to kill every Jew that's in there. And yet, here it is, Charlton Heston going, Behold the power of the Lord! Best, best Ten Commandments movie ever made, Charlton Heston. Amen. Um, time is it? 
I took my watch off. Ten after. Let me read this. Psalm 7, verse 14. Behold, notice, oh, look at this verse. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. How many of you would say that your iniquity, your sins, caused you great sorrow in your life? The things that you lost that you could have had. The opportunities that will never come about now. Because they've been taken away. Behold, he tra travaileth with iniquity and hath conceit. Notice, the, notice the, the progress here. He travaileth with iniquity. He conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. That verse right there, believe it or not, is telling you of the birth of the man of sin. He's a man made up of iniquity, mischief, and lies. Falsehood. He is the one born again of corruptible seed. We're born again of incorruptible seed. He made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. I think that's going to be funny when we get to see that one. Oh no, he's digging a ditch. They're going to kill us all and throw us in there. And all of a sudden, all of the German soldiers fall into the pit and get shot this time around. Amen? His mischief shall return upon his own head, uh, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. And I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. And I'm going to tell this story because I like it. Uh, I, you guys know I'm a student of history, but especially World War II. Uh, to me, how how Hitler took control, how Hirohito convinced, or the warlords actually convinced those Japanese soldiers to dive bomb into the ships so that they wouldn't miss and kill themselves and do it all for the glory of the emperor. And those men willingly did it. They at least got a shot of sake before they got into the plane. Okay. That might have helped them a little bit. But I'm, I'm just amazed at this. And early on, before the concentration camps got really good at killing up to 10,000 Jews a day in one concentration camp, the German soldiers, the, um, I can't remember the, the word for it, but uh, these German soldiers that were called forth to lead Jews into a dug pit and stand there and wait for the German soldiers to shoot them into eternity. Those German soldiers would line them all up, make them all strip their clothes, every one of them. Old women down to young children all had to strip. They were all led into these pits that those soldiers dug they shot and killed every one of them and buried them in the pits. Now, they had the Nuremberg trials. They got Goering. They got, um, they didn't get Himmler. Um, they got at least 12 of the top men still living who were in charge of the Third Reich after Hitler killed himself. And they found practically all of these guys guilty and they hung them instead of giving them a soldier's execution, which is to be shot. and uh, But there was one of them missing. His name kept coming up in the Nuremberg trials, but nobody knew where he was. And it was um, uh, Adolf Eichmann. And Adolf Eichmann was the man designated to coordinate all the trains and to get... Listen to this now. He talked the rabbis into telling the Jews to get on the trains. And they did it because their rabbi told them to do it. By the time their train got to the concentration camp, about a third of those Jews were already dead. They didn't provide them any water, any food, no place to go to the bathroom. Many of them were sick. The rest of them were dead. And they were just basically cramped in there, sitting or standing on top of dead bodies. And Eichmann is the one who arranged every bit of this. When the war was over, uh, Eichmann and his family fled to Argentina. He took on uh, a new name. Um, 
what was it? It, it was like a, a Spanish name, Roberto Clement. And for years he lived down there and nobody knew what happened to him until finally a Jew in Argentina saw him and said, that's Eichmann. So the Mossad went there to spy on him. They figured out it was Eichmann. And a lot of the Mossad agents were going, let's just go down there and shoot him and let his name be ob obliterated. But the prime minister at the time said no. For the first time in our history, we're going to bring the man who was responsible for loading those trains and sending our people to the death camps. We're going to bring him back to Israel to stand trial in an Israeli court. And I, the, it's a neat story. The guy that d actually did it, he told the story. He put a glove on because he didn't want to touch Eichmann's mouth. But he had practiced this, how he's going to grab him, getting off the bus and walk into his house, grabbed him, drug him down into a pit. The other Jewish spies drove up, threw him in the trunk. Uh, they hid him out in a safe house until El Al, the Hebrew, the Jewish airplane company, they finally sent a plane down there and they got Eichmann out of the country and he stood trial behind bulletproof glass and for the first time, the Jews got the man who killed over six million Jews and he hung. I love that story. Because basically, he's the one that dug the pit. And hanging him in, in Jewish ideology, why did they hang him? Cursed. Be anyone who hanged from a tree. Then they burnt his ashes, and they took a ship out in the middle of the ocean, and they dumped his ashes out so that he has no final resting place. He just floats in the sea. I think it's a neat story. Uh, let's take prayer requests.